Living in a difficult childhood forces us to develop a certain set of skills to survive. And these become sort of our way of viewing the world, our beliefs, our lessons we learn. And the difficult part is they, these lessons and the way we adapt to things in childhood often serve us. They get us through childhood. The problem is they often become lifelong beliefs and lessons we need to unlearn. So here are 10 lessons I would suggest you work on unlearning if you had a difficult kind of toxic, chronic CPTSD childhood, difficult childhood basically, um, where you are now realizing that there's a lot of limitations to what you believe and how you show up in the world. It's almost like you feel like you like live in this little box about of what's lovable and what's not, and it's a very tight place to be. Number one, love is confusing. And we learn that love is confusing because what the parents said and what they did often didn't match. So they might be telling us they love us one day and then raging and being emotionally unsafe the next. And it was just always like what we felt in our bodies didn't match what we were being told or what we experienced. And so we're, we were forced to face that love doesn't really make sense. Love is confusing. And as a result of that, we often accept a lot of unacceptable behaviors and partners and others because we find ways to justify, minimize, dismiss it because, you know, we didn't have safe love in the first place. So love is confusing. Number two, love is conditional upon what I give you. And so we learned that it is all about, love is all about what we sacrifice, what we give, what we're willing to minimize, dismiss, let go of. And there's a conditionality about the version of ourself that we believe we have to be to even consider being loved or lovable. Number three, love is my sacrifice. Love is about sacrifice. And I think generally love is about sacrifice. But in a very complicated kind of childhood, the sacrifice is always for us. I have to let go of my feelings because you had a bad day. I have to forgive you because you didn't mean to do what you did. It's always our sacrifice, which often is because these kind of parents didn't have any real ability to own their behavior, shift it, change it, make repairs, and that there was no real reciprocity. It was kind of a one-way street. Number four, bad behavior can always be justified. So no matter what happens, we have learned to dismiss and make bad things okay. Now, it might be that your partner doesn't spend time with you and they work and they make a lot of money. So you're like, oh, well, that's what they have to do. But meanwhile, you look around and your other friends who have husbands or wives or partners who work the same jobs or make the same money actually participate in the family. Or you justify the way your parent talks to you because they have trauma and they can't help it. Or you justify that the partner had an affair because it was your fault because you didn't do X, Y, and Z. Whatever it is, you always find a way to justify or minimize other people's bad behavior. While you never excuse yours, you hold yourself to this ridiculous standard, when it comes to others, you always end up telling yourself, well, that's just, that's just, that's just how it is. Number five, I don't deserve safe love. Deep in your heart, if you did not have an emotionally safe childhood, more often than not, the wiring is that there's no such thing as safe love. And I certainly don't deserve it because what child, what little person doesn't deserve safe love? And so you go into every situation already from the position, already from the position of that, I don't deserve your safe love. So I can tap dance to get it, I can sing to get it, I can love you more, I can forgive you, but when it comes to expecting you to generally show up in a safe, loving way, I don't expect that. Now that could be with parents, partners, whatever. Number six, it's always my fault. So oftentimes because of our requirements of compulsive caretake and parentification, enmeshment, compulsive caretaking, I think I said that too fast, um, we basically think that everything is our fault, right? It's our fault if the parent had a bad day and they yelled at us. It's our fault if our partner was expecting us to do something one way and we didn't. It's our fault if we walk into a room and people act kind of weird, like if we did something wrong, people are mad at us, like whatever it is, we are the center of the, of the negativity. So whatever happens, it's our fault. Number seven, people who love you will hurt you. And this goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, that oftentimes love is confusing. And so deep down inside, we believe that love is supposed to hurt. 
And so unconsciously we go out in the world and we seek partners who we believe are going to heal us. But deep inside our, un our underlying fundamental belief is that, well, yeah, like love is supposed to hurt. Number eight, being alone is the only way to truly feel safe. Now this might be because of your feelings, because of your sensory issues, because of your hypervigilance, but at the core, because of these childhoods, the only time we feel completely safe is often when we're alone for different reasons, like I'm saying. And so we often isolate and isolating becomes our number one strategy. And so we don't know how, we have no other tools or skills to deal with being dysregulated, overstimulated, whatever it is in relationships with people, because what we did was we went to our rooms alone, we got in the car, we went for a walk, whatever it is, or we had no alone time. But when we left the house, that's all we do now is spend hours and days and weeks alone. And we know that as a society, we're, we're pretty lonely, right? So you can also be, be this way and be lonely in the relationship with someone else. But no matter what, it's like, I'm always this little person unto myself to deal with whatever's happening with me. Number nine, emotions aren't real, aren't valid, aren't safe. So some kind of injury happened around too much emotional expression, not enough emotional expression, whatever it is, emotions aren't a place we feel safe. Either they feel scary for us, overwhelming, or we avoid them, avoid them and numb them, or we take too much and then blow, and then we feel shame about ourselves. Whatever it is, emotions are not a safe place and we don't often have the tools to really um, understand, communicate, and express them to ourselves and others. And lastly, that being a perfectionist is the only way to get love. So workaholism, busyaholism, doing, doing, doing equals love, right? So no matter what we do, because we're never enough, going back to everything's always our fault and all those things, we are always trying to make ourselves better to prevent ourselves from being rejected. So if I'm just a little bit better at this, a little smarter, a little more successful, a little cleaner, whatever it is, we're always comparing and we tear ourselves apart. The way we manage our fears of being rejected through a lack of perfectionism is by being intensely cruel to ourselves and how we talk to ourselves. And those lessons can keep us, if we don't work on these, and there are more, but these are often the core. And I think if we don't work on these, what we're really walking around carrying is the belief that love is meant to be um, hurtful, that no one is trustworthy, and that being shame-filled is how we should expect to go through life. Because the truth is, if you believe all of these things are a large part of them, there's pretty much no chance that deep inside you don't believe that at the core you're unlovable and unworthy. And that is why love looks like all of the things I just mentioned. So those are all really important. And of course, things like trauma therapies, identity work, learning how to manage the dysregulation in your body through nervous system regulation skills, learning how to challenge your core beliefs, setting up boundaries with people, practicing saying no and saying yes, looking at, you know, who am I? What do I believe? And even going back to videos I made last week about, you know, do I live in a fear of abandonment? Do I live in this place where I don't really know who I am? All of that work can help grow us up from the inside so that we naturally start to believe and experience some different types of um, experiences with people around what love looks like. And at the core, we stop blaming and abandoning ourselves in order to kind of maintain these lessons that we learned because we had to abandon ourselves in childhood, but we don't have to do that anymore. So I hope this was helpful. I know these, is, these are tough ones to talk about, but I think they're so important. Thank you so much for being here. Please stay safe and well, and I'll see you soon. Bye.